No Man's Sky has no reward for exploring. Oh, what are you talking about? There's a there, there's there's an achievement you get from taking lots of steps. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris are joined by Will Parsons to discuss the repetitive element of exploration with No Man's Sky as a focal point. Plus, a gaming meta on another Metroid 2 remake and impressions of Empire Builder. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 75 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hi. And I'm joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And we have a returning guest with us, Will Parsons. Hello again. And today we're going to be discussing, uh, or rather, we're going to be continuing our discussions on repetitive elements in games, this time focusing on exploration. Uh, and the reason that we're focusing on exploration this week is because of a, a certain game that some of you might have heard about called No Man's Sky. Um, a couple of us have played it, uh, and we have some impressions. Uh, and of course, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of discussion going around on the net recently with its release. Uh, apparently, the uh, the game did not quite live up to the hype, Could, su- surprising no one. Could I propose a name <laughs> change? Yeah, one sorry. man's hype. One man's hype. Oh, wow. <laughs> so this poses a really interesting philosophical question, which is how many times can you talk about repetitive elements before it becomes derivative? Well, the uh, the rule of comedy is, or the, the magic number in comedy is three. Uh-huh. And so this would be our third discussion on repetitive elements. Sweet. So we're hitting so, the sweet spot today. Yeah, we might be. And, then if we, and if we go with the fourth one, then we're starting to push it a little bit. We'll have to see kind of how we're feeling. So, so, uh, so you're suggesting this, this is an episode for yucks? We're going to have some yucks in this one? I don't know if we're going to have yucks or not. Okay. I mean, maybe, I mean, there will be some, like, yucks, as in, like, yuck, this game is disgusting, I'm Oh, sure. okay. Um, <laughs> no, actually, I, I have I have mixed feelings about it. I have good things to say about it, bad things to say, but I think uh, I think a lot of reasonable people will agree with that. Um, but before we get into uh, what's sure to be a very interesting discussion, and it's not just going to be about No Man's Sky, um, but we'll have uh, some opening segments for you, including Nostalgia Trip. Let's all go on a nostalgia trip to see what we can learn from games of the past. I've spent the last couple of weeks running around town and i found more than one retro arcade that's opened up here. There's, there's actually one in the mall local to us. Uh, it's kind of small. Has a Sinistar cabinet, though. I don't know if there's anyone here yes, played Sinistar. Yes. yes. In fact, I played it at Free Play. Yes. They is, also just got it yes. at Free Play, which is the other one. Uh, that's, free, a fun, that's a fun cabinet, by the yeah, way. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. It, it's amazing. You spend most of it not really worried about things shooting you. They're shooting at you, but you're spending the whole time gathering elements so that you can have bombs ready for when Sinistar walks onto the map, threatens to eat you, and you have to blow him up as he chases you around the map. Excellent. <laughs> um, it's kind of Asteroids-esque, but the map moves as you move around it. Hmm. Uh, but no, I've been spending a lot of time in a bunch of old retro arcade games. Um, specifically the Star Wars and Tron cabinets. A lot of time on those. Oh, yeah. They're very limited on what they have in them. Uh, just classic way of making a game. You start out real simple, and then it just gets harder. Uh, you know what's coming. Like, every time, you know what's coming already. And it's about learning the pattern. Mm-hmm. Which is great. Um... I actually find pattern learning... It's why I like... Uh, what are they called? Uh, platformer games. Mm-hmm. All the villains in platformer games are very repetitive. They go through the exact same pattern. Um, and when you learn that pattern, you can speed through them really quickly. We've gotten to a point where a lot of the games that we make now emphasize prediction and learning from the boss. Um, Warning Forever, which is a retro style game from... What was that? 2000... 2002, 2003, the boss actively learns as you fight it. Hmm. Every time that you shoot it, it's done in a green wireframe style. Every time, every level is just a boss fight. Hmm. Every time you kill it, it comes back and it has changed itself to adapt to what you did. Oh, wow. So if you were flying off to the side and shooting it from the side, it now might have more armor. If you've been focusing your fire on it and just shooting directly at it, um, maybe it's adapted so it's shooting missiles at you or reaching out with melee weapons. This is a shmup? Yeah. What did you say the name was? Warning Forever. 
Okay. It's a free game. You, you can go download it, it. It's yeah. it's unbelievably <laughs> good. Um, but we've moved towards more things like that. Uh, Dark Souls is really popular because the monsters change the way they fight as you fight them. Mm-hmm. But they're programmed to do that, and so it's very, very predictable. When you can dodge and roll, or rush in and just roll out of the attack because you know how it's going to attack you every time, um, there's nothing that it'll learn. You can learn one thing and never see the rest of the game. Uh, with the with all of these older arcade games, the pattern is always the same. Every time you go up against a, a boss, they go through the same set of, of things. And it's learning that pattern. But you die and you come back and you go back in. And I have I personally have really missed that about old games. Um, I like going in and learning the pattern. I like dying three or four times as I try to learn that, oh, now it's switched to doing this. Um, so yeah, old arcade games, they do that very, very well. It's time for War Stories. Tales of tribulation and triumph in gaming. So as we mentioned, uh, a few of us have been playing No Man's Sky. I know Doc and I have tried it. Will, you've tried a little bit of it on the PC. What I can, what I can play? Yeah, what well, you can play. Your your hardware's not quite up to. Uh, yes. quite, not quite up. Oh, to don't it. blame the man's hardware. No, no, <laughs> it is up to the requirements for the game. Okay, it is up to the. Re- I can load it. I can run it. Mm-hmm. I have logged four hours, which for you guys is probably actually the equivalent of an hour, because mm. I am playing at roughly a fourth of your speed. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. I see. But Doc, you said you um, you have a war story one. Well, I do. Um, I actually lucked out a, a really, really well whenever I loaded up the game, my particular playthrough. Um, as you know, um, or maybe you don't know, the whole marketing thing behind this game is that there's a, you know 18 point something quintillion worlds, and so everybody's starting world is going to be a different one and everybody's experience is going to be a different one and that's the whole point is the meta um well as it turns out i I did the heavily curated first hour hour and a half of the game and then moved on to another world and and to another system and whenever i got there I, i landed on a planet that was uh beautiful it was it was absolutely green it had little clovers everywhere there were no animals to speak of um lots of flora but no fauna the weather was nice the atmosphere was nice occasionally there was a storm that was a little bit cold but my atmospheric suit could handle it and as it happens there's these gorgeous giant golden pillars just jutting out of the ground of of actual gold you go into the many, many caves in the cave network that's down there, and there are these albumin pearls, which are worth about 20, depending on your game, uh, about 27,000 uh, units each. Which is a lot. That's a lot. A lot of a lot. Um, and so basically, I was just cruising around, and by the time I left that world, I played for two days on that world. Um, by the time I left that world, I was a deca millionaire. I had upgraded my ship twice, and I had a fully... I can't really say fully, but a an extremely decked out um, personal suit with lots of space. And so I basically had everything I could possibly want after being on that one world for two days. So I went out and I explored, and I did the thing you're supposed to do with the, the little kind of, call, I guess I'd call it missions. Um, it's just a little sort of experience to sort of drive you towards the center of the universe and figure out what Atlas is and some of these little mysteries. And the the question comes up that pretty much everybody gets, which was, um, do you want to take the black hole and get closer to the center of the universe? So I did. And I got about 200,000 light years closer to the center of the universe. And then the, the game started just mm, attacking me, basically. Everything was a poison world or a radioactive world or a super uh, terrible this and that world. And I had all the specs I needed to overcome that. But the problem was I had spent so much time doing... Uh, this idyllic thing where I was working on sort of an economic victory that it became very frustrating for me. And I actually dropped the game. And I I said, it was, it was you, Chris. I I said, you know, I I think I'm done at this point. um, If I play, it's going to be Voyager. It's going to be me trying to get home. And something just clicked when I said that. Mm. And I realized that's exactly what I need to play. Uh, As that turned out, I had actually put a waypoint back on that other world. And even though it was 200,000 light years away, I I decided I was going to go. So my very first thing became upgrade the hyperdrive so I can jump seven or eight systems at once. And now since then, I've been playing with a glorious attempt not to stay, not to find new things, not to do anything, but just literally to get back home to 
uh, the world I called Mossy Land. <laughs> so that's been my gameplay experience. I basically have just ditched everything, felt a little bit railroaded, and uh, even as an explorer game type, it wasn't satisfying enough for me to just find new worlds, whatever. Um, Isaac Carth, who has been on the, the show before mm-hmm. on his mm-hmm. website, on his blog, I should say. He spoke about procedural generation. He did. He, so. he spoke about, uh, well, on, and that's what his blog is about right. as well. Uh, but he said the most brilliant thing that I've, I've heard about No Man's Sky, which was, and, and I probably misquote him just a little bit, but, but it was basically this. There aren't 18 quintillion worlds. There are exactly as many worlds as you discover before you stop playing. Mm-hmm. And that's, to me... The problem, the core of the problem that the game has, and we'll talk some more about that as we move on, but you have war stories too? Yeah, so actually the most fun I've had with the game uh, is when you sort of get into the survivalist element. Um, The exploration was interesting for a little while, but then when you discover that, you know, I I think I would be more into exploration if it was a little bit more realistic, where Mm. if you have multi-biome planets and you have a lot more empty space, and so finding something that's fertile and lush and resource-rich is actually exciting, because Mm -hmm. it's an exception and not the rule. Um, <clears throat> but I ended up on this one planet and I was low on, um, uh, launch thruster fuel, which gets you up off the planet back in orbit. Right. Um, and so I landed and I was going to go find some plutonium in order to get my ship back off the ground. Well, I made the, um, the unfortunate mistake of landing on a floating Island that I couldn't reach with my jetpack. And so I was down on the surface gathering plutonium and I couldn't get back to my ship. Oh, no. It turns out that this planet was actually an extremely cold planet where even when it's not storming, even when it's not night, it's cold enough that your uh, your exosuit's having to work, you know, do the life support in order to keep your um, to keep your uh, suit climate controlled. Right. And so, um, you know, it's just this race against time. You have to either keep it stocked up by recharging with zinc or something else, or you have to, you know, be in your ship or in shelter or something like that. Um, and so I needed to figure out a way to get back to my ship. The only way you can really do that if you can't reach it with your jetpack is to call it from a you know some sort of outpost or something like oh, that of course so i set out looking for a beacon and then i found out where a, uh, a colonial outpost was is about 20 minutes away on foot and so i've got to <laughs> cross this plane in, uh, for 20 minutes on foot um with this cold that's constantly trying to kill you and then it, if it turned into night it got even more rapid the uh the exosuit loss uh because it was extreme night temperatures and then if it starts storming extreme night temperatures plus the storm makes it even colder mm-hmm. i mean like it's it's really rapid like you can only stay out just for a few moments and you have to get back into shelter So it was this really, it was actually like some of the most fun I've had in the game though, because it's like this really cool battle against the elements for survival. And I actually made it uh, most of the way there. um, And then the game crashed. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) And and that's how it uh, resolved. And so I reloaded and I ended up uh, back on my ship. And uh, and I I didn't want to just like reload from my ship because that was the last save point, but I didn't want to cheat it. Can I ask what system you're playing on? Uh, PS4. PS4. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, so it crashed on PS4. Yeah. Huh? It doesn't happen very often, but it happens every now and then. Yeah, I've had five or six crashes since I was playing. I, I mean, you say that like it's no big deal. Oh, no, no it's, like, a, it's a big deal. Yeah, a game, it's, it's big a deal. A game that releases with crashes, to me, is a big deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. A couple episodes ago, I talked a little bit about um, AM2R, another Metroid 2 remake. Um, that project that came out, and I talked a little bit about the way that Nintendo hadn't mentioned it, mm-hmm. but also hadn't done anything to shut it down. Um, things changed. I tweeted out some of those on our um, official Twitter account um, at Backward Compact. So essentially what happened was, uh, well, just to say a little bit about the game, I actually did play all the way through it and finished it. Um, I almost got 100%, but not quite. I still got to go back and do a little bit more exploring. Mm-hmm. Um, it is really quite excellent. It does a really good job of updating the original Metroid 2, kind of basically taking the original Metroid 2 concept, still still going with the same concept, but using a lot of the design choices that were um, implemented with Metroid Zero Mission for the GBA, which was based on Super Metroid. Mm-hmm. Um, and it basically takes all those elements in order to create uh, what I believe to be um, one of the very best Metroid experiences in quite a while, at least 2D Metroid experiences, because the 3D Metroid, Metroid Prime series, which I also love, is very different from the 2D games. Right. Very similar in some ways, like in terms of tone, but in terms of gameplay, very different. You mm-hmm. said this is one of the better stories, too. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I like the story in this one. Um, it, it really is the one that introduces a lot of the story elements to the Metroid series. Mm-hmm. There was very little story in the first one. This one introduces... Um, 
the baby Metroid. It's how you meet the baby right. Metroid. But there's this story ongoing throughout it that essentially you're being sent to a planet to commit genocide on these, mm-hmm. on these creatures. Mm-hmm. And you learn about the different um, uh, evolution is the wrong term. Um, the development of these, like the different life cycles of the Metroid mutations, maybe no, it's the, it's the life cycle. Like, mm-hmm. cause they, they, they change as they, as they grow and they get older and all the ones that you saw in the uh, original, metamorphosis. Yes. Metamorphosis. Thank you. Just like in tremors. Yes. One through five mm-hmm. and the series. Yes. <laughs> great, great films. Uh, but yeah, so in the original Metroid, you only get to see, you know, the, essentially the larva stage of Metroid. Those are the ones that right. we all know about. Um, and of course those do exist in Metroid too, but, but you don't actually run into those until the very last part of the game where you're getting towards the queen Metroid. Otherwise you're facing Metroids of different, um, stages in development. And of course they get progressively more dangerous as they go along. Um, particularly the Omega Metroids that the battles with the Omega Metroids, the way that they're set up, very nasty. The ending's great. The, the battle with the queen Metroid has multiple stages. It's, little bit easier than I expected, but it's still a really fun experience. And yeah, it does have a storyline. It has a, also a, a hidden area where they add in all these extra story elements, similar to Metroid Prime, where as you go along, you get little log entries based on this, the, the previous attempt to stop the Metroids and what happened to this, this, this group of like scientists that came there to study them. And then the group of mercenaries that came to see what happened to the scientists. Hmm. But anyway, to get to the actual project, um, so Nintendo did actually send out a DMCA notice shortly. In fact, it was the, the night that we recorded shortly thereafter they to sent who? out to um, first they sent it only to hosts that were um, that were basically hosting the download for the game mm-hmm. for AM2R, and then they eventually sent it to the actual main blog where it was coming from. They did not issue a cease and desist though. They only issued a DMCA notice. So they t- took down the download for the game on his official site and mm-hmm. so did various people and other other sites. However, you can still find the game through like Torrent Services. Um, he is also still releasing updates to the game. He just released one recently. So he's releasing updates, but not the game itself. You kind of have to go a little hunt, like on a little hunt for it. Um, apparently what happened here... Basically patches, in other words? Patches, yeah. Okay. Uh, for updates and stuff. And um, it's unfortunate that they did this. Uh, what I've been reading, and it's good that they didn't do a and d because then you'd have to shut everything down. Yeah, it would. Um, essentially what the way our copyright law works, Nintendo sort of, or IP law, I should say, Nintendo kind of has to protect their IP or they can lose it. Yeah. Um, so they kind of had to send out a DMCA. Um, it's a little obnoxious because they could have technically taken a different track and officially sort of licensed him out to, yeah, to release it. Which is what I said. They could have done that for free. They could have just said, okay, sure, we officially let you do it. And they could have also avoided the the issues with losing their That's IP. That's a tricky precedent to set, rights. though. It really is. If you tell... It's like not, just the, it's the community not a, out there right. that like any given person can make an Nintendo thing and you have a chance of getting it licensed. Yeah. But that's but the same but the thing is it's not a precedent. If you're doing it and you say we're doing it specifically for the, in this one instance, you're not setting a precedent because there's nothing that obligates you to do it again. That's well, kind of the whole well, point. Sure you are. That, I mean, I'm not I'm not sure what definition it, of precedent it, you're it, using. It sets an expectation in the community. Yeah. Right. Because then I, any bozo who does a thing is sure. you know, look, I made a Mario. And oh. then and then if it's terrible and most people would agree it's terrible who liked, you know, aim too hard. Right. Um, there could be a number of people who think like, Oh well, this was a great remake and it fixed everything that was wrong with it, and yet it might be like much worse by most people's standards. And that's perfect. It's, 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 it's very subjective. Yeah. I, and I get that. But my point is there's no obligation mm-hmm. to do that just because you do it once. Mm-hmm. It gives you no obligation. I, I think it's just a rabbit that's hole. Fine. They don't want to go down. I think they should have bought it from him personally. Yeah. They, I think they should have too. Bought it and released it. They could have, they could have done that. They could have paid him money for it. There's a lot of options. They, they hired him on words. because it's, especially since Nintendo seems to not want to make another Metroid game, whether it's 2D or 3D, mm-hmm. like an actual Metroid game, because Federation Force is not a Metroid game. It's just mm-hmm. using the Metroid name. Oh, by the way, you said that uh, Nintendo was ignoring the 30th anniversary. Yeah. They did have a uh, thing in Mitomo where yes. they got a free Metroid team. I saw so, that, yes, yeah. yes. So they, they acknowledged it in a sort app of. that nobody uses. <laughs> so. yeah. oh. um, used it for a little while. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting situation. I do understand that unfortunately just kind of the way that our copyright laws are set up they you're sort of obligated to protect your ip in certain ways that seem a little um petty so i don't want to blame nintendo too much i do feel that they could have handled it a little bit better but at the same time i'm assuming this was probably handled by their legal department and unless the higher ups actually bothered to check out the game they may have never even heard of it so the legal department just sees it issues the exact same notice probably doesn't play these games or follow them they're just issuing the same notices to everyone 
And that's the main reason why you're not getting exceptions here is because they don't know. They're literally, mm-hmm. they're basically just robots. I mean, they're lawyers. They're robots. Yeah. They're horrible it's, people. It's just, <laughs> it's just send, your, thing. send your hate when, mail, when, too. When I heard about this, I just wasn't <laughs> surprised, and I, I don't expect it to be any different, you know, and I don't think it's anything malicious. I don't think it's, it's just, I, I didn't say it's malicious. I said, it's just business as usual. I didn't say it was malicious. I said mm. it was, it was not the right decision. Mm. That is my, my personal take on it. I, think I don't, think, I don't think it was the wrong decision either. I think it was just business. It was something they had to do. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying they could have handled it better. Now it's time for table talk discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. So one of my favorite places to go hunt for old board games is a store called Half Price Books. It's actually headquartered out of Dallas, so there's a lot of stores around here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of my favorite ones is down on Northwest Highway. Uh, oh, I, I, I work near that one, so yeah. I've actually gone there several the, times. The big Loop 12 one, yeah. right? It's, it's enormous. It's got a coffee shop inside of it. Um, and so I'm down there uh, last week. I'm actually on a date with my wife that tells you the, the kind of dates I go on. Um, and, and, and they're in this nice big board game section. And what you do is you just sort of ignore all of the opolies and you ignore all of the trivia games and you ignore the uh, you know the, the plastic uh, put together the mall and go shopping game. You mean they finally came out with Diopoly? Yeah, I'm sure they did. Uh, and what you do is you you just look for the rare gems. Mm. I'm ignoring you. <laughs> yeah. uh, the rare gems, and I found one. Uh, Empire Builder, 1996. If you remember the train games, this is from the, the sort of the origin of those train uh, series where you get the crayon out and you actually draw on the board. Okay, So they're not that uncommon. They still make them. They still uh, reprint them. But the beauty of this particular copy that I found is it was brand new. The uh, the crayons were still in the bag. The, uh, the 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 stickers were still on the sheet. And so we broke this out and we played it last night. Um, now, Will, you have a copy of this game, right? From yes, the I do. from back in in the in the it, day. It has a dish rag in it with mar- with crayon all over it. That has been the same dish rag we've used since 97. Brilliant. So you've been playing this series for a lot longer than me. Tell us about your just whole impression of the series, why you like it, where, where, how it's come along, some of the countries that, that are... Because this, this classic one is just America. Yes. And you know the old one. You know if you have an original one because uh, they, they made changes to Mexico? Well, they added Mexico later on. Oh, okay. Yeah, they start with just uh, just the United States and Canada. Right. Um. I don't believe they parts of Canada even because they don't include Alaska. Mm-hmm. So it's the continental United States with um, like 500 miles worth of Canada, uh, right, right, 500 north of the border, just basically where most of the Canadians live. Wait, and you're you're building your empire in the U.S. Yes, parts yeah. of Canada. Yes, because this huh. is this this whole game is centered around roughly the area the the era of big trains. Right. We don't typically say big trains <laughs> outside of just that train is really big. Rail barons, um, if yeah. you will. So to basically describe this game, it has one of my favorite mechanics of any game, video or otherwise. The one thing that I really do enjoy about games that actually exist, as opposed to just games I want, the sole goal of the game is make money. <laughs> now, this it's different from other games where your goal is to make money and then exchange that to get more victory points. Right, right. Your victory condition is, I have so much money and I am everywhere. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's actually one of the things that impressed me about Scythe uh, yeah. recently is that you actually the victory points and the money synonymous. Yes. Hmm. Um, it's, it has always bothered me that having tons of money at the end of the game won't let me win. Right. It's in a, it's it's a game centered around economy, and I cannot win through money alone. Um, it that really is, makes no sense. That is the first thing that kills me on any game that has money as a as a thing. But they're trying to teach you that there's more to life than just money. You know, there's about like accomplishment and the way you're perceived. And I'm building Chris, a Las stop. Vegas casino. Yeah, no, stop, stop joking here. That's not true. I'm building a Las Vegas casino. Why do I need victory points for right. not cash? Because exactly. game designers are idealists. Uh, so Can't anyway, use. in this game, not only do you have well, Ticket to Ride is a very good intro game for for uh, for rail, rail sure, games, yeah. but it lacks um, the rails are pre-built for you. Yeah, that's even right. Silverton, which is another great game. Rails are pre-built for mm-hmm, you. Mm-hmm. Um, Railroad Tycoon or Empire Builder uh, is a map filled with dots, 
and you build your rail line. The game is different every time. That's right. Because you build your rails based on product demand. You literally draw them on the board. Yep. You get uh, you draw cards that say these cities want these things. You draw rails and you move your train to deliver a load. So everything is procedurally generated. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Emer- um, emerging properties. It's probably worth mentioning that um, on the board, it's ge- geographically accurate, yes. which means that there's mountain ranges. I was about to ask about that. Yeah, um, yeah and, and the things that the cities want and the things that they produce are also very, very accurate. Um, uh, like, for example, on, on the one that I played last night, the new old one, uh, New York <laughs> produces tourists mm. and, and nothing else, right? Mm. But down south in Miami, you can get um, oranges or fruit. And, and you know, so it, it really feels accurate. And throughout, you know, up through Texas, you get oil and, and coal, things like that. It's actually a great um, local geography and economy board game. It really is. Um, I've seen some people use it for uh, homeschooling, things like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Me too. Really? It's, it's interesting. It's effectively useful for that. Huh. Yeah. Um, with the proper teaching, you can't just throw the game at kids and expect them to learn stuff. Uh, That's usually what I do. I mean, I you know, working for a uh, educational game company... We basically just throw games at kids and try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. You just throw I'm it. Kidding. Yeah. They'll, they'll pick it up. They'll figure <laughs> it out. No, that's um, pretty. That's pretty neat that people. Yeah. So people are actually using it like they, as, as a teaching tool. They can uh, with, with some with some supervision. In in a way, so when we started playing it, I was further further advanced, but um, my parents use use that for education for younger kids, and we picked up. You were mentioning the different countries. Uh, my family had um, it's called Nippon Rails. It's the Japanese. Uh, landmass. The economy is completely different in the game. The products are different. There, you have new things like ferries and um, uh, bridges between continents mm. um, or islands between islands. Uh, you end up with things like Russian rails, which takes place right before the fall of the Iron Curtain. There's actually a card in the deck that when it when that calamity comes up, the Iron Curtain falls, and so trade between. Uh, trade across the Iron Curtain, whether or not there's a fee changes. And it changes the face of the game after that point. Hmm, that sounds amazing. Um, they've added in... Uh, we had Australia Rails as well, which, if you don't know anything about Australia, it's mostly desert from right. like, the center of the map. Um, the outback. Yep. So you can, learn, uh, you can learn a lot from it. Uh, they yep. branched out mm. and did... Um, after they covered most continents, they had India Rails, uh, Euro Rails, UK Rails... Each one having its own separate thing. Like, you really don't want... On the U.S. map, you don't want to start out in kind of Arizona area. Nothing really goes Mm -hmm. there. You're setting yourself up for failure. It ends up being... When you look at it at the end, it ends up being a lot like the actual rail lines yeah. that, that ended up. I mean, it was funny last night because we were, we were joking about that. Oh, look, I just made the Santa Fe line and I just made the, you know, the, the, the B&A, the BNC. And the, you know, it's, yeah. like, it's hilarious because um, the geography is so accurate that you just you end up going, I'm not going through the mountains. That's crazy. I'm going to go through the valley here. I'm going to take the – I'm going to connect New York to Chicago and it's going to look exactly the same as it does in real life. And if you're, if you're talking about the emergent – emergent play. I've played this game so many times that at this point, my goal in the game is usually not, well, it is make the most money, but it's not winning the game. Right. Um, most of what I enjoy doing is how big can I sprawl my rail line? Uh-huh. I, I enjoy having a single line that goes down the center of the U.S., which is not economical mm-hmm. until you've done it. Right. Um, and then three spars in on the West Coast, East Coast, and in the Midwest. See, that makes so much sense. You could go anywhere you want. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. It costs so much money, though, you will not win the game doing that. Right, that makes sense. Um, but it's a personal goal. I love it. <laughs> that's uh, fun. Never play to win. Play to uh, meet right. your own personal goals. And speaking of personal goals, I think that's a great segue into our media discussion. And now, this week's media topic of discussion. So continuing our discussion on repetitive elements in games, we're going to be exploring the topic of exploration. Um, And you promised yucks. Here they are. (laughs) Start yucking, folks. Um, That was a really bad yuck. It's Uh, topical. It's like a hair top. Oh, my. Um... So the, the the thing that sort of prompted this discussion was No Man's Sky, but we're not going to be focusing exclusively on that. Uh, that being said, it is a uh, yeah, time... Jim didn't play it. 
I was never interested in it. Yep. <laughs> to be honest, I mean... How many games have I played that I wasn't interested in for our roundtables, Chip? Mm. A few, but that's the way roundtable works. We always say, hey, is everybody willing to play it? <laughs> I'm not going to pay $60. That's the thing. I mean... <laughs> We've had you play, play buy some games that are you know cheaper to play. We I don't think we've ever forced you to buy a sixty dollars. I'm game. literally inventing like controversy and stuff okay. we have not talked about <laughs> yeah. just to put you on the spot because I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, because it's fun. No, because I'm being a jerk. <laughs> um, to, to me, honestly, that's one of the big things with that game too. I expected No Man's Sky to not be sixty bucks. In fact, I think originally it wasn't planned to be. No, you know what? And I, I'd love that to be a great starting point actually because. Um, I think we need to talk about what was promised, the price point for what was promised, and recent, let's call them trends, in this type of game. Now, uh, it's going to be difficult because we have to kind of even say, what is this type of game? So I'm going to make an obvious comparison and then debunk the comparison, and that is Minecraft. Yeah. Okay? A lot of people, I think, expected Minecraft. I even talked about it on the show at one point. Is is it going to be like Minecraft? And I think it has about half of the elements of Minecraft. Lots of collecting, lots of um, crafting, if you will. It's, it's technologies and that sort of thing. Um, but then the idea of the building element is just not there at all. But but also the, the multiplayer element. Right. That was and, the big loss. People... people we're questioning that too about hey why can't I see other people in the game? Why Absolutely right. Well, let's 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 stick a pin in that for a moment though because I, I want to stick on this idea of price point that you brought up, mm-hmm. which is um, when when Minecraft came out, it was an alpha, right? Yeah. And it didn't have much. It had like a dozen blocks, and that was it. And the revolutionary thing was look this. This world is eight times the size of Earth, or whatever it is supposed to be. And um, it has these things we're going to call biomes, even though they kind of sort of aren't. And um, you can craft stuff by actually digging it out of the ground and and go all the way down to bedrock. And it's just amazing. And people were just blown away by this this new, brand new game thing that, that happened. And... You could get into it for, for just a couple of bucks. It was mm-hmm. like it was like twelve bucks or something, or, or twenty four bucks when it first started, because it was in alpha and it was this, um, you know, this this new thing and nobody quite knew where it was going to go. Very very quickly, uh, it became apparent that people wanted m- multiplayer, and so they they shifted their focus during alpha over to multiplayer and server versions and that sort of mm-hmm. thing, and that just became the standard. And because they, I'm going to say. Uh, co-developed with their fans. So what we were talking about earlier, this idea of, um, you know, where, where does the line get drawn between fan content and, and mods and, and all that other stuff. Um, but, but basically uh, Mojang was able to say, Oh, okay. This is, this is an element that's clearly important to the fans. Okay. My question, my sort of general question is, have we been unfair to, uh, no Man's Sky, because they didn't call it an alpha. They've been very clear in the idea that they want to add stuff and change stuff. They're talking about adding crafting, or not crafting, but building. Mm-hmm. They're talking about adding multiplayer. They're talking about adding other things. Or well, are you trying? Is, to, are you trying to say this is an alpha? Is that the suggestion? Well, that you're that I, I'm saying this very much feels like an alpha because sixty dollars for an alpha is, and I agree, is BS. I completely agree, and I think that what happened here was they wanted to have their cake and eat it too. Yeah, that are they, and I, I don't know all the details behind development, but it also kind of, I kind of get the, the vibe of they felt pressured to put something out because they've been working out for so long, and what they needed was another five years, but they really, were forced yeah. to settle with five and just put something out, uh-huh. and so they have That's some. what it was. <laughs> Not, not the money. Not if they wanted to get well, get it out there. To I'm make sure money. the money helps too. But I mean, when they they were they were indie and then they got a publisher. Yeah. Um. So that and that's going to affect things. Too. You know what? Publishers take on the risk, and that's that's the way that works. So yeah. when the publisher says it's time, you mm-hmm. go. Um. You pull the trigger. Honestly, what I think they have created personally is this wonderful, wonderful platform or uh, uh, foundation for something that's going to come. You remember me talking about the hit, the generate universe button, mm-hmm. and I think they've done that. They've created a generate universe button. Uh, my understanding is that there were features that they literally pulled. Like somebody was telling me um, that they, originally the planets orbited the suns, mm-hmm. and um, they they pulled that feature. Hmm. Um, basically, because it was just too complicated, and they they didn't they didn't want all that, um, and the the biomes that we're talking about that kind of a thing that might have actually been in the original plan, but everything got just simplified down. Um, so I guess that's that's what I'd like to hear from you guys more than anything is uh, what what was wrong about the game that made it 
disappointing. We can talk about it being disappointing, but the truth is there's a lot of really great stuff in it, too. And, I'll, and let's talk about that. From a technical standpoint, it's fantastic. From a meta standpoint, it's brilliant. Uh, I mean, um, the thing that got me looking at it, and I was not even interested in this type of game, which is why I don't play it. But the thing that I've noticed as people are posting, and I actually share, I actually linked y'all to this video as well because I just thought it was hilarious. Uh, the, uh, the, the disappointment of the dinosaurs. Yeah. Yes, and the, <laughs> I, the idea there was that they put out at E3 back when it was first announced, mm-hmm. what, like five years ago or something, I don't know. Um, they put out this, uh, it wasn't that long, but they put out this um, video where, you know, they're on this planet, they have all this, like, nice, lush scenery, they have these little animals running around, they have this big dinosaur. The brontosaurus thing, yeah. Yes, and so there was this, this, this expectation. Now, they talked about, oh, yeah, of course, these are, these are the sort of things that will be procedurally generated for you. Well, of course not. What, what they did there was they, they used, perhaps, game assets, but mm-hmm. they built it. They built that specifically for the E3 presentation. Yeah, of course they did. Then you look at the... But the expectation from people when they did that as procedural generation yeah, was that yeah, you were these, going to get that giant experience. These brontosaurus-like things walking by, herds that, of smaller that will creatures all, running Yes, that will yeah. all work together nicely. Then yeah. you see the reality, which is in the video that I shot, and it was like this... This like warped looking <laughs> like like chicken T Rex thing yeah. <laughs> in this ugly ugly space, and the reason the reason being when you have procedural generation, you end up with things like that. That's you know? right. You don't end up with this beautiful area because mm-hmm. that's something that has been curated. That's something that has been put together and, and designed mm-hmm. versus something that is just put together, you know, with ones and zeros. And that to me is is one of, it's one of the main reasons I don't play these sort of games where they promise all this hey, eighteen quintillion worlds. Uh, mm-hmm. Well. Not really. The other thing that I've heard from uh, criticisms, because, again, I follow a lot of different gaming people on purpose so I can hear things about games that I don't even play. One of the big criticisms that I've seen, including from game review sites, is that you're supposed to be having, people are supposed to be having these different experiences, but then they come to find out these different experiences are actually shared with basically everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of faked. Like one of them was talking about how they, they went to this planet and they met someone and got married or something like this. You guys may have experienced this. Like, no. Something along these lines. It might happen later on. But then they found out that everyone kind of had the same experience around the same time in the game. Oh, I see. So little things like that kit would keep cropping I up. abandoned the main storyline, so... And that's probably why, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things where people, I think, had so much... Su- such... I don't know if high expectations is the right word. I guess, I guess it would be. But the reason why it was so hyped was because... They talk about all these these um, options, like the 18 quintillion worlds and all these things you can do in procedural generation. Then people jump to these conclusions mm-hmm. like, oh, well, that means that you can kind of do everything and you can all have your own yeah. unique individual experiences, when technically that was never promised per se. So, well, so it was I think, implied, yeah. but it was never promised. I think what happened is someone left the hype machine on for yeah. overnight, and um, basically the developer said, hey, look, we're working on this thing, and here's what it does. And I've heard some people argue that maybe the de- developers should have done a better job of like reining in expectations. Oh, no, they should have, and I will make that argument. Mm-hmm. It, it is, it is their fault. But, but it is their fault for, for letting that grow. Regardless, I think though what happened is, you know, it grew. So they said this thing, gaming journalists said, oh, the possibilities are like this is so amazing. Here's what could happen with this game. And then people who weren't even hearing directly from the primary source were looking at all these gaming sites and it's like, oh wow, No Man's Sky is going to do all these things. And then it just kept growing and growing and growing and growing. And then they showed like, you know, there's round two where like, okay, well, No Man's Sky is a game where there's space. Uh, we don't really know anything beyond that. It's like, okay, here's what you're doing in No Man's Sky. Sky, and then hype round two happened, and everyone's like, "Oh my god, you're gonna be able to do everything in this universe, and it's gonna go on forever, and it's gonna be amazing." And then you know, you go and you play the game, and for me, I was never really following the hype. I went into it with an open mind and an open heart, and oh, you gave, gave wow. it. A, <laughs> I, I, I grew up. Oh, I grew up playing Sonic I, Adventure. Oh, <laughs> so, I'll, I'll tell you this right now. So I, did I. <laughs> I, I still wouldn't say no, that. I was, I was joking at, about the open heart. At, at this point in my life, I don't go into games with, <laughs> with that the, experience yeah. that costs sixty dollars. Right, I don't. But, but that's, maybe that's just it. my my point being though that like I, I went into it with basically no expectations just basically this sense of okay this is like they're gonna be this really big thing it's got procedural generated space and let's see what it does mm-hmm. and. I wasn't, I was neither disappointed nor particularly impressed. I'd say, like, probably the most positive thing I can use to say about it is that it was inspiring and that it had, like, all this really cool, all these really cool ideas that were it handed over to me. It's like, okay, cool, we've got this base, let's do this with it. Yeah, we've um, already talked about yeah, that. We, a lot. We, we, yeah, Doc and I have talked at length about, like, all the things we would do with No Man's Sky. It's just that, like, there's all these things that seem super promising that don't really deliver. And that's kind of the biggest issue. Well, you are a content writer and a copywriter. Yes. 
what what was your reaction to the content of the game in in terms of the experience that you have meeting other aliens and, and telling a story and that's sort oh, of and thing. the content of the game yeah so so here's my issue i the game actually delivered most of what I was looking for it just did it wrong interesting um honestly when I heard about no man's sky uh I saw oh this is going to be a game centered around going out and looking at stuff mm-hmm. and you are the first person to see this stuff that's the point nope um, I'll, 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 I'll get to finish. that. I'm, I'm gonna let um, you finish. So open your heart. Chris. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Save that for the final boss. You don't use that line because um, then you end up with like Sonic Shuffle or something. <laughs> Sonic Adventure Two, where they just repeat that mantra. Right, right. Um, so what I was literally expecting was a 3D Starbound. That's not saying a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. So. What I enjoy about Starbound is literally just fly to another planet, walk around the surface, dig down a little bit, see what's there. You will find the same races over and over, but in different arrangements built differently. You will find roughly the same kinds of alien life um, that are palette swapped or just different mixes of them on a planet. Planets are done differently, that's it. There's a core storyline, it's not really that important. Mm. Um, but really, it's just, here's our world, go fly around in it. With No Man's Sky, as soon as they had mentioned the fact that they were adding in this space combat portion of it, um, I should not have actually bought the game. Mm. I knew it was going to be in it at that point. And And, and the space combat part as well is something I I did want to mention because I know initially they didn't have that as part of the game. And they hit this point, and this is how I knew the game was going to be, end up disappointing some people because it felt to me like they reached a point where they go, oh crap, uh, we don't really know what we're doing for gameplay. And they just added the combat. It, like, it yeah. felt very tacked on when they when they announced it. Even the survival and crafting feels a tad tacked on. That's what, yes, it all of it did because they had no gameplay. They realized they had created this procedurally generated space. Mm-hmm. And they had, they had created the, you know, the engine for it. And they were, they were ready to create all these different worlds and, and experiences. And they go, oh, wait a minute. What are people going to do? Oops, mm-hmm. we forgot to make a game here, guys. And they just tacked on a bunch of stuff. And I understand some of it may have worked and some of it didn't. But whenever you, you do that, you're not starting from your base. This is what we want to do. And you're sticking to it. Instead, you're just tacking stuff on. You're never going to get a, what feels like a complete experience. Mm-hmm. And that is where I get to my point on what you were talking about, content, buzzwords. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It touches on what you were talking about mm-hmm. with the things they said. Mm-hmm. They said open space, we don't really know what you're going to be doing in it, mm-hmm. we're just making it as as freeing as possible. Mm-hmm. In their mind, that's, we are making really pretty worlds, yeah. we are, oh, I just lost the name of it, um, Magrathia. Mm. Right. We are Magrathia. Right, that is a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy yes. reference, mm-hmm. yeah, the, they were um, making the, the planet builders. commissioned by the mice. Yeah. yeah. So, that is what No Man's Sky was. We're just going to make this stuff, we'll throw it out there, you guys will just travel and check things out, Everyone else is hearing because they use the wrong buzzwords. Mm-hmm. Those words all mean we are making an open space with a ton of stuff in it. You can go around doing whatever you want. And because they were deliberately vague, people put their own stuff mm-hmm. in it. Right. It's less of a problem with the hype train mm-hmm. and more of a problem with they were playing with words they don't understand. I, uh. But see, I, I don't think they were I don't think that was what they were doing. I think they I think they had an engine, and they so they, but they didn't know exactly what they were going to do with it, and so they were purposefully vague right. when they initially start set up their Kickstarter, and then they when they started seeing the hype, they sort of let just kind of let it go out of control on purpose because they're like, hey, we're getting money in, right? That's that's my take on it, and maybe that's just because I'm a cynical person, so <laughs> I just assume people are probably going to take advantage of stuff like that, but that's generally because most people do, yeah, and that's called marketing, and I do that for a living, yeah, it's <laughs> terrible. Okay, so in the world of game design, especially game design academia, um, there is a process for making sure that the first hour to hour and a half of a game builds excitement, even even the open world stuff. Um, it, it focuses you in, and, and we've talked a lot, uh, especially uh, Jim, we've talked a lot about like um, tutorials and how, right. how to do rep right and that kind of a thing. Well, No Man's Sky has a, has a thing where you're you're crashed and you're stuck on the world and you're trying to build your ship back up and that's how you get into uh flying around on that planet and then that's how you get off the planet and and then you've got to do your hyperdrive and all that stuff how did you guys feel about that 
curated experience, which it basically was, even though there were procedural elements and in, in the world itself was different and that kind of a thing. Mine was a very hostile world that was trying to eat me. Uh, I was attacked three or four times um, by sentries just for trying to collect materials. And that was, that was very frustrating and difficult. I find it interesting that in a procedurally, in a game that seems like it's focusing on the procedural generation aspect and this open world aspect, that they start you off with a very specific you know, curated experience mm-hmm. at the start. This is something that I want to get into a little bit more here in just a moment, but mm-hmm. to sort of answer your question first, Doc, um, I appreciated what they were trying to do. And like you said, Jim, they're trying to proceed. They're trying to curate this thing to kind of get you into the game to teach you about some of the mechanics and stuff like that. And I did appreciate that I had to earn that first space flight. Yeah. You know, because if you just start in space, then like, you know, the, that sort of moment of taking off from the planet and seeing space for the first time, mm-hmm. that moment's a really cool one. And that's one that you would have lost if you hadn't had that. Oh, yeah. Um, but the it does, it does lead into um, something about the game that I want to talk about. And I think that can lead us into our more broad discussion of exploration exploration in games as mm. repetitive development, et cetera, et cetera. Um, talking about the, the what works and what doesn't of exploration in general. And I think that one of the things that really bugs me very quickly about this game is that for a game that's about going out and exploring empty space, the space is surprisingly unempty. There's a start, there's a space station in every single system. Yeah, there is. Um, there, there's alien habitations on every single planet. They look like trailers. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's in the, there's, there's ships, like, you know, you go into space and like, yeah, there's like this cool moment occasionally that happens where like, you know, these ships will sort of like warp in incidentally right as you're leaving atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it happens all the time as if someone's following you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a little and, creepy. And it doesn't, and it happens, and like, I'd, I'd even forgive it for happening in like mm. the first star system, you know, where like we're trying to have it this cool moment, but then like sort of tone it down a little bit. It happens all the time. And I think that. Every time. Yeah, and the fact that too, that, you know, even, even if players weren't expected to you know, start or even if players are kind of, um, not interacting with each other, I feel like there's a lack of an objective, um, that you kind of need, I think for exploration to be meaningful in games. Yeah. I, I, what I kind of see, like there's no background, there's no context for anything. Say you start all the characters or all the players on like this one system. This is the system where you get trained up. This is the system that we're sending you out from to go explore the vast universe. Mm -hmm. And between all the players, we're going to go outward and discover the universe. Instead, what happens, happens you have random people starting in completely random places and not having like you, you it doesn't feel special to discover something because every single thing you see has been undiscovered by players and yet at the same time it's been discovered by something else because every single planet has colonial outposts and abandoned facilities mm-hmm. and you know shelters and space stations you know what that, I mean? that's to me what what seems so odd about the game when i started to see um people posting images of it or mm-hmm. talking about it on like facebook or twitter mm-hmm. or something mm-hmm. um i kind of expected and i think a lot again a lot of people i think did expect to be okay i'm an explorer in this universe and i'm going to be going and exploring these different planets and the expectation of habit of, of habitation being so widespread, mm-hmm. I don't think anyone really had. Right. I think it felt more like, oh, I'm going to be the explorer of this of this universe with right. the 18 quintillion planets or what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just think that's a very odd choice that they made. Like, I, I wonder where that design decision came from and because it seemed like literally no one talked about it or wanted it, and yet that's the direction they went. And I, I think what ended up happening is that they made certain de- decisions for the sake of the play cycle that you have, which is um, basically gather materials to power your ship in order to gather more materials to be able to sell to do things like, say, upgrade your ship and upgrade your suit and stuff like that. Um, and you do that by selling and trading at these space stations. Yeah. And so they wanted to make it convenient enough that you can hop off of one planet, go to a space station, and then maybe hop back down to the planet or to go to another planet in the system without having to do a That's hyperspace right. jump. And there's locked doors, and, and you have to have Atlas keys, and it's mysterious, mm-hmm. and well, who is this, why is it, you know, that sort of thing. But but at the same time, what you've got is a situation where you can never be trapped in a system because you ran out of hyperdrive fuel. Mm-hmm. And, Will? I was going to say, what you're describing, that there was no goal, there was no reward for exploration. Right. right. Yeah. There's because every system reward. is basically Because there's the no true danger. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, no, I mean, there's, there's no reward strictly for exploring. No Man's Sky has no reward for exploring. Oh, what are you talking about? There's a there, there's there's an achievement you get from taking lots of steps. Well, there's also uh, <laughs> you, you also there is you also get credits for uh, uploading your discoveries. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> there's so so when I play a game, 
I explore them. I explore every game I play. Me so too. Like, you mentioned Sonic Adventure. Mm-hmm. I explored every map in that thing. Yeah. I got to places you're not allowed to yeah. go <laughs> because it's what I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we mentioned we mentioned Metroid before, and yeah. a big part of that series is you you explore the area to find extra power up that right. you necessarily have to find. Yeah, that's an emergent part of it, though. Yeah, it is. it's just you looking for. Yeah, Metroid does a good job of rewarding you for looking for those places. Right. Um, games like, and I was going to have to do this eventually. Echo Junior. Mm-hmm. Echo Junior <laughs> has no game. It's just an open ocean map, and mm-hmm. you go between pages of this map. And you just swim. So it's all self-exploration. Mm. Your only reward is you're actually you're swimming as a dolphin. That's it. Um, it's not really a game. The, but creating a game that rewards you for exploring and not for nav point navigation, I haven't really run into one of those. The only ones that do that are, are games like Myst, where you have a very clear goal, right. mm-hmm. a very muddy clear goal of, I'm trapped, I need to get out. Uh, text adventures where you are just exploring because you have other things you need to do. Nothing ever rewards you for exploration. A journey comes to mind. Um, that was a, a very on a rail, very linear thing. But what was neat about that was you were always playing with another player, and these emergent forms of communication came out because there was mm-hmm. no speech. I think that was more what it was about, really, than the exploration aspect. Because, like you yeah. said, it was a pretty linear yeah. experience. It yeah, wasn't it was. really you go anywhere. Yeah, um, it was supposed to be an experimental attempt at um, Campbell, Joseph Campbell, mm-hmm. um, which I think was all done visually, and that that in and of itself is fascinating, uh, fascinating idea. When it comes to visuals, I think that No Man's Sky nailed it. Uh, every every screenshot looks like a '70s album cover, and it's beautiful. Uh, if you're into that art, art style, it's it's going to be very rewarding. That lasts for a couple of hours. Yeah, you can't yeah. you. You can't sell a thing on on images anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got two generations of Nintendo consoles with lower level graphics that are still doing relatively well. Yep. it's there has to be more than just the graphics. Yeah. yeah. So to to make this a little bit more broad than just the No Man's Sky discussion, mm-hmm. um, to me, and and this is something that Will had talked about. I really do think, and you had mentioned it as well, Chris, that when you have a game that is about exploration, you really do need to have. Um, some something driving you to mm-hmm. explore, and I do agree with what Will was saying that I think you should have rewards for explore, exploring, mm-hmm. and whether that is in in a game like say um, a Metroid game or like say Legend of Zelda, um, where you're looking for things that are not necessarily required, but mm-hmm. they're they're optional bonuses like an energy tank or a heart container. Right, Jesus mechanical bonuses, in other words. Right, mechanical As bonus. opposed to narrative bonuses. As opposed to narrative bonuses. But there are also narrative bonuses yes, in these games, certainly. too. Like, for example, Metroid Prime mm-hmm. and, and Metroid um, Metroid 2 Remake does this, too, mm-hmm. where you have these log entries where you're getting um, narrative information about the world if you explore. And you don't necessarily have to find that information um, through scanning and what have you, but you can. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's the same thing. It is a reward for exploring and scanning new places. Um, with games like... Uh, Grand Theft Auto, Red Dead Redemption. I think we have to talk about those in terms of exploration as well. These these um, essentially sandbox games or mm-hmm. open world games probably is, is, is a better term for mm-hmm. it because they're not they're within a sandbox, but they're clearly focused on the game element. And you just you happen to be in a sandbox, right? Um, and and that's what I think has made those games so successful um, is that they give you this this area that you can play in, but there's still um, a story, there's still goals, mm-hmm. there's still th- uh, direction. As opposed to just putting you in a space and saying go. I'll uh, mention that one of the games I was reminded of very frequently while playing um, No Man's Sky was Freelancer, mm-hmm. um, which is now getting a uh, spiritual successor now in uh, Star Citizen, which some people might have heard of. It's kind of a crowdfunded thing. It's it's different from Freelancer in a lot yeah. of ways. Well, and I, I, was, I, was, about that the I was super excited when you said spiritual. So I was like, wait, they're making another. Yeah. The guys from Star Lancer are making another Freelancer? Really? No. Really? You're just crushing me. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but Freelancer uh, was a game that was like, what, like 2004 or somewhere around then? Yeah. Um, it's right around the time that Sonic Heroes came out. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> That's, we, 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 we measure time by Sonic releases. Um, <laughs> There's one every year. <laughs> <laughs> which is weird. Um, the uh, But Freelancer had um, like the whole thing with being able to trade and being able to upgrade your ship and I think like it does a lot of things that No Man's Sky does, except it does it a lot better. Mm. Uh, one of the key differences being that it doesn't procedurally generate the universe. You've got a designed universe. Um, 
that you know you you have like they they designed this planet's gonna be in this location and it's gonna have like these routes between these other systems and stuff like that and we're gonna have these like you know quests and missions installed and you can kind of just like go around and you can explore and you can kind of do whatever you want it's called freelancer because you're not really beholden to anyone in particular and if you so desire you can follow the main storyline or you can ignore it um but there's always something to do and even if it is just that cycle of i'm going to keep upgrading my ship and i've got this personal goal of having a really big freighter that i'm going to be able to make just millions and millions of credits on you know each each run um that, that's a personal goal you can achieve and that's something you can like theoretically do in no man's sky it just doesn't do it nearly as well mm. um i think that no, no man's sky really did want to be just like a go out and see everything sort of game and then it suffers from the problem of the procedurality doesn't really make anything feel that different um i think in doc we, we mentioned this uh, mm-hmm. when we were talking and this is something that i think i've even mentioned earlier in this mm-hmm. episode they really underestimate the power of nothing uh, yes and exploration yes in the same way the music like the rests are just as important as the, as the notes if not yeah. more important you can't constantly have just noise happening you need to have the pauses and like the here here's the the process of you know and the, somebody might argue that the process that they're talking about here is like, you know, the, oh, there's the flying through space until you get to the planet. No, I mean, like, I want to go to a system and see that there are, like, three barren planets with nothing of interest. And maybe I'll hop down on one to kind of see it and, like, okay, this is a nice view, but then hop back up. You go mean to the like next. our solar system. Yeah. <laughs> like, go, we have one planet that's yeah. really of interest yeah. and the rest are, are empty. There are, um, there are no gas are the giants. Super interesting. Interesting. Well, well, I, I meant in terms of, like, I know. habitation and. and things on them. And, and like, I can even forgive the fact that you like go into any given system and all the planets are kind of clumped together, not orbiting their star, which I really wish they did. Um, but like you land on them and really like there's some slight differences and it's like, Oh, I've never seen a blue planet before, but like for the most part, they basically all look the same. And like, you even find that like some of like the, the mineral formations look kind of like seashells. Yeah. They just change that, the that, color palette. Yeah. That shows up on every planet. I mean, it's, it, it really like how many you, rocks with clovers on top have, have I seen? Uh, 18 dozens, quintillions. Dozens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it really just, it, it, very quickly, and this is something that I kind of expected even when I started playing, I, I figured it's not going to take me long to lose interest, and that point really hits very, very quickly. It does, yeah. Um, Though, there's a there's a flip side to this, and I think it's really important, and, and I'll keep talking about the No Man's Sky experience, but I, I, want, to, I want to speak of this in more broad terms, yeah, mm-hmm, okay? sure, yeah. because uh, what... What I think is really important as we move forward with this genre, which we will do, we're going to be able to procedurally generate stuff really, really well moving forward. And it's going to be exciting. And more assets is one key. But you also have to understand what it is you're trying to get to or else more assets won't help. Yeah. Um, and, and it's this. Very clear design goal. Yes. Right? Uh, to, to, to answer my own question from, from a couple of minutes ago, my first hour worth of play was really, really exciting and really, really enjoyable. It, that once I got the ship repaired and I was actually up and, and over the planet, I didn't want to leave the planet because I wanted to explore the planet. That felt meaningful to me. And I just flew. And I didn't even understand how the sensor worked or anything. I just flew. And then I saw this thing. That, and, 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 it, and it was so compelling and so amazing and so insane that I had to stop and, and just drop down next to it. And it was this alien monolith. And I went, oh my my gosh, I have lucked out. This planet has an alien monolith on it, and I have found it. And then every planet this has like This is insane. <laughs> right? and, and so I did that, and, and I actually took screenshots of what happened because it was so profound and so moving for me. Mm. I will read to you what this thing said. It said, the an imprint of an ancient civilization was once absorbed by this strange marker. The story of the Viking somehow spills out in the language of my own people. And it says, The will of Herc commands that the noble traveler will be spared. Their journey through the cosmos shall not be thwarted. It is so decreed the Viking shall honor the judgment of the belief of the ancients. Seep help with language. And that's where I learned my first word. And I was just like, this is so amazing. I'm going to learn the language. There's going to be a story. It's going to be meaningful. It's going to be so... Oh! And like you said, Chris, mm-hmm. there's dozens of these stupid monoliths on every single planet. Yep. When I went a little further, I found my first trailer park uh, filled with aliens. And I thought that was so meaningful because it had an alien in it. I was actually finding an alien. Wow, there's actually aliens in this game. Wow, that's so cool. And and the problem is there's just literally 
hundreds on every single world, and the, and the world is lousy with it. Yeah, it, that power of nothing that you're talking mm-hmm. about. I think as we move forward, we need to get the percentages right. And yeah. I think the way to do it is to study nature. I think we need to figure out in nature what's the actual likelihood of me walking out and, and finding a four leaf clover or or even a three leaf clover right now. Yeah, or, or or this. Say say you go off. You know, we there, we have woods around in our area. Go off in, into the woods and start walking around and see how long does it take before you actually see an animal? Mm-hmm. Yes. Because they're there. I mean, they're out there. But how long is it going to take you to see an animal? That's right. They come not, out at night. Not long. Mm-hmm. And also, it depends on. The it depends area on the type too. In. It no, depends on the area well, that you're in. Too. The area you're in. Having been in both uh, jungle and urban, mm-hmm. um, jungle, you run into a lot of animals. Yeah. In actual jungle. Even, yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Even out where my parents live, in the middle of nowhere, Texas, I have gone outside and I have run into um, coyotes, cougars, deer, snakes. Rabbits. So anything small that you think of, um, we chased. A, we actually chased a mountain lion um, out back behind my parents' place. Uh, that was dumb, but we did it. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you actually do run into these things pretty regularly if you're on. A, if you're in an area that is less densely populated, mm-hmm. even here in in a larger city, they're everywhere. Well, here you look around. You what you what you see a lot of are like squirrels. Coyotes and deer. They're you rarely see the coyotes and deer when you're walking around because they don't tend not to get too close. But it depends on where you are too. Yeah, I'm talking about some of the areas that I've been in. But but again, I think it's important to look at these 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 different areas too. Like yeah. if they're going with, say, for example, oh, all these places are, ha- are are habitable and we have all these space stations and all this kind of stuff. Then why are there all these animals running around everywhere too? So it's like it's almost almost like you should have some sort of inverse relationship between how common the animals are running running around and being, and being close to these industrialized areas. And I don't think it's a bad idea to have established civilization in a game like this. So oh you my have, goodness, where are the cities? Yeah, well, yeah. you should have like, bases yeah. of operation. But then have those be hubs from which you explore. Right. Yes. So you spread out from those hubs. And then like you know you can, you can choose to make the game about going from hub to hub mm-hmm. if that's the way you prefer to play. And you can make that choice for yourself. Um, but it's not like every single thing is exactly... The same. Do, do you think that what they may have done is when they were setting this up from aside from just having too much like not enough nothingness mm-hmm. but do you think maybe they tried to go too granular with the way they set up their procedural yes. generation mm-hmm. because I, and to compare and, and I'll let you you know talk after this but compare it to something like for example Diablo mm-hmm. and he, I'm talking specifically about the original but obviously the other two did it as well right. they didn't use they, they were not very granular with their procedural generation intentionally they they created things in chunks like yes. they had they had chunks of, of dungeon for mm-hmm. example mm-hmm. that they would piece together in different ways so each time you entered that dungeon floor it would be different and yet you can't just memorize the map right place. right and plus the 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 um stuff that you would find inside you know chests and all that would change Mon- the monsters would be in uh, somewhat different locations there might be different monsters but there was always similarities between each floor I'll, I'll, always on like a certain floor and I forget the exact floor number, but on this exact floor, you would always run into the butcher. He would always be in this certain certain area, and there were, there was always little places in there that that were consistent. And in each floor, was sort of built between with with certain rules with these chunks, as opposed to we're just going to create parts of like you know dungeon pieces and then build the entire the entire great floor, example you know fifty floors or whatever. What if I told you that I could get you a copy of No Man's Sky that is like that? fun to play, has more of an emphasis on actively moving forward in exploration, and is just $5. Okay. Yeah, there's a there's actually a mobile game called um, Out There. It's the Omega edition of it. Huh. Um, rather than starting out uh, crash-landed on a planet as an amnesiac who can't remember his own language, mm. um, because that's the only explanation I can come up with for why you know none of these alien races. Even who, though they're everywhere. And they all have the same <laughs> technology. Mm. Um... Honestly, I tried to tell one of them that like I was the same technological level as he was, and he said, "I don't believe you." <laughs> I'm like, "I'm jumping worlds, and you just don't. Be- you don't." I flew here. I'm wearing a spacesuit. Nice. Um, I remember that actually. Yeah. So this game, you shouldn't be able to remember that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If, that, <laughs> if something has supposedly 18 quintillion anything, <laughs> you should not be able to relate to an and experience I, will have. And I think that highlights part of the problem with the game is that. They have some curated quote unquote content. And it just highlights the fact that basically all of it is interchangeable. The fact that the like whatever plan you're on, whatever system yeah. you're in, doesn't matter. Yeah. That's that, not procedural, that. that's random. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a good that's actually a good point. 
that, that's a good way to describe it. Yeah. But you were, and, but we were promised that it wouldn't be. We were yeah. promised it wouldn't be random. We were promised mm-hmm. that it was derived from science. People believed it. I know. <laughs> the whole finish time your, I finish said your thought. Well, sorry. What they need to do is they need to hook it up to Google's Deep Dream algorithm. Yeah. Only set it for like animal parts and planets, mm-hmm. so you can get worlds that are not single biome. Mm-hmm. See, this makes so much um, sense. But to finish out with uh, out there, because I believe I've mentioned it to you guys. You before. have, yeah. And um, I'm I'm going to download it right now. It is it is basically you start out waking up out of cryo sleep far from home. Your ship is fully functional. You have basic supplies on it, and your goal is to get back to Earth. Mm. On a single starship, you go from star system to star system. Some of them don't have anything. Some of them just have a star. Some just have a gas giant. Some have a rocky world. Uh, a couple places, it's a black hole. You are jumping from star system to star system. You are looking for technology that can help you. You are looking for aliens that can help mm. you. You are looking for raw resources to fix your ship as you travel. Um, you're looking for fuel to keep going. You're looking for air so you can keep breathing. But that's all the game is. But it's a lot more barren in the sense of like like our our universe actually would be. It's actually or at least as we see. It's actually more it along is. the lines of um, the Fermi paradox. His argument is that there should be all these great alien races out there. Oh, it's yes, more in I've line with his viewpoint of what should already be out there. Mm. So you do run into alien races. They're not on every world. They're not in every system. And when you find them, they are either a low culture, or they are a high like you're getting cities. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can go and meet them. It also does the thing where you learn one or two words at a time. The difference is the way that game is built. The sentence structure is such that those one or two words are key and give you a lot of information. And after you've picked up four or five words, you know what they're saying, even though you're still missing half the sentence. In No Man's Sky, I get five words from five monuments. Individual words are so important, they give you an achievement at three, five, and eight. Yeah. yeah. And then it's like th- every three or five after that. Which is just embarrassing. Um, I, think, I think, too, another thing that would help No Man's Sky is if the planets were multi-biome, mm-hmm. because then you'd have a reason to explore the planet and not yeah. just to explore the system. You can drop on the planet, and for a thing that's supposed to be as big as it is, and that's one of the things I actually love about the game is the sense of scale. Mm-hmm. If you're not using your pulse drive or you're not doing hyperspace jumps, like you'll target a planet you know, out somewhere out that yeah. way, and it's a nine-hour flight. Which is awesome. Like, if yeah. I wanted to, I could actually fly nine hours between planets. Uh-huh. You choose not to because it'd be slow as hell. But just the fact that there's that sense of scope and that sense of scale is awesome. Yeah, so there's four different but, engines. But given use. that... For those who can't see my face, I, I <laughs> balked at the idea of even considering <laughs> nine hours of just flying. We used to do that with Flight Simulator and Train Simulator. You'd set up a flight and you would run the whole flight. And there are, there are whole groups of people who they've got servers online set up. And they are doing regular flights. Yeah. And they're flying for four or five hours. <laughs> um but, <laughs> all right, <laughs> all right. But, but I guess my my point being though that for a game that has all this procedural generation, that have planet sized mm. generated you know environments you can explore, I shouldn't be able to feel like I can drop down on it, walk around for maybe two minutes, and be like, okay, I've seen enough of this planet, and take off. Yes. So, um, I, I think we're getting to the point where uh, we should probably wrap up and, mm. and move on. But Doc, I, I I feel that you have something that you want to say to close this discussion out. Well, I was just going to pose the question, what would a a truly repetitive element exploration game be like to you guys? Mm-hmm. Um, so if yeah, we could st- r- wrap it by asking, you know, we, we've talked quite a bit about, especially in a specific case of No Man's Sky, kind of what mm-hmm. doesn't work. What would work? What, what would work? Yeah. yeah. Well, I would say I would say a great example of something like that is a game um, like Metroid, where you're you're consistently exploring purposefully. You're either trying to find um, the next hidden area mm-hmm. in order to advance in the game, or you're trying to find um, a power up. So there's always something like your exploration has a purpose, and that purpose is generally smaller in scope. And once you you know once you capture something, you just kind of move on to the next thing. Like so you find something you want if to they came out with a game that, that promised that it was procedurally generated in such a way, like Diablo, yeah. so that you could play with Metroid mechanics um, and your experience, your gameplay experience was fundamentally unique to you, um, would you play it? Would you Would you be excited about that? And what what's the gameplay like? Is it like you said? Like- just like Metroid. Oh, then yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, would you prefer that, or would you prefer uh, an option like Mario Maker, where um, all the fans can make levels and upload those, and, and mm. you can play those? You just have an endless pool of content. I could, yeah, I think but that's designed to content. 
that could be interesting too, actually. I mean, I think there's a lot of ways they can go with it. Um, like, like you said, Doc, we need to get a lot better at procedural generation. Mm-hmm. This sort of game, and it was why I was kind of against it at the start. I just never, I don't, I don't trust procedural generation of this sort right. to make a better experience than can be designed. Okay. I just don't trust it. I think that you can use procedural generation like Diablo did mm-hmm. to a point and you can make an outstanding game. But if you try to go too far with it to the whole 18 quintillion world, you end up with random and not procedural. And I think that's that's a great distinction that you drew. And I think that's something that um, kind of sticks a pin on the whole topic, really. That procedural versus random. And, yeah, where, and it kind of maybe crossed that line. Okay. Well, um, so using since we've used it so much at no Man, uh, on no man's sky at what point does it stop being new when you land on your second planet mm-hmm. that's at right at that point everything else is the same thing repeated yeah um variants on a theme mm-hmm. for for games we typically need something that guides us some reason to go to the next spot if they could create using the same like template based diablo map thing mm-hmm. a system of mist worlds that are procedurally generated. Mm-hmm. You have a reason to go to the next planet. You have a reason to do the next mm-hmm. thing. Then you are actively exploring your environment because you have a goal for it, a reason for it. Each new world, eventually you would reach the same point, and it's mm-hmm. a race to see how far out can you make the person go before they run out of new stuff. Yeah. How mm-hmm. far can they expand before they are completely reliant on emergent gameplay? Neat. Mm-hmm. Chris? Um, again, to sort of say, I mean, like there's, there's a number of different games I think they could have exploration, but I'm going to sort of use No Man's Sky. And I think that when we were talking about this doc, you and I had an interesting idea. What if No Man's Sky was the frontier? You are exploring because you're sort of staking your claim on numbers of planets. You're trying to find one, the planets that have resources that might be worth developing. Mm-hmm. Um, but then once you're there, you want to build things. You want to sort of like, you know, put up a beacon where people start to settle. And you start to sort of see a civilization grow kind of in your wake. Yeah. Um, and you sort of are establishing these hubs and it kind of allows you to go out further because now I've got a base of operations out here. So now I can reach that thing without dying. Um, if it was more like it felt like there was more of a purpose that I'm out here because I am one of the trailblazers for my civilization Mm -hmm. some objective besides just i mean like there's nothing inherently wrong with as one person put it a walking simulator with survivalist elements (laughs) um if there was some reason for me to want to find planets with particular attributes and then you make it so that not every single planet has that i think that that would give you more of something to build on even if that wasn't your focus in the game say if i wanted to make my own fun and say well you know what i'm more interested in just getting like a really awesome ship you know i'm not i don't want my empire to be super massive i just want to have a really cool ship with which to do this Mm -hmm. but what's the point of the awesome ship if you have nothing to do with it yeah yeah so i think objectives are a very important part of anything with exploration Mm -hmm. yeah i agree and I, i think you hit on something important jim when you said granularity because uh, if, if an individual world is not worth spending the entire rest of your gameplay experience on, the next one won't be either. And so, to me, I think the the less of more and more of less principle is incredibly important here. If you hit on a system that is uh, really fantastic like I did on the second uh, time, I really should have just stopped there and, and played there and just enjoyed my experience there the rest of the content beyond that was all downhill and so whenever you um whenever you're really looking for that goal experience thing like like you're talking about you have to ask why do players play games this is the game i was hoping i would find i was hoping that i would find um the the beautiful world to be meaningful and i could claim it as my own i could set up a base and then i could set up a beacon or let's call it a stargate and that whenever I explored out from that base of operations, mm. then what happened was I could um, teleport back um, using galactic teleporters or something like mm-hmm. that, as seen in Star Trek II, um, and and then come back to my home base. Or maybe I could hire some of those aliens that I found and, and employ them sort of in a... Um, uh, NPC style thing so that whenever I went out and I explored and I came across Jim's stuff 
which needed to happen, by the way. He's my friend. I know him. I want to find his stuff. I think that the power of of look what I made is extremely important in games like Minecraft. And and for him to come across my stuff and be like, ah, I met your NPC and all that tower you made and all, you know, did you know there was a a mine like three miles away from your thing, totally full of pearls? They're gone, by the way. (laughs) You know, that kind of a thing. And and I'm, I'm not entirely sure that if Jim actually somehow managed to come to my planet that the thing I mined wouldn't actually still be there for him. You know what I'm saying? Right. We don't know that yet. So I think it needed to be a little bit more EVE Online mm. combined with Minecraft uh, and a little less of, but it's pretty. Go see more pretty. I, I will say that because we've talked some about Diablo and how it handled it, I thought it was very interesting. You talked about Oh, and I could I would have this one hub space, and I would go out and explore, but I'd be able to, to teleport basically teleport back, back home, like just like the town portal, yeah, in Diablo. I didn't even make that connection, but you're yeah. absolutely right. That's exactly <laughs> what it's like. You literally want to play Starbound? Do I? That is exactly what you just described. Oh, it's pixel graphics, but that's what you get. Yeah, well, Nick. what I want is Starbound that looks. Like yeah. No Man's Sky. That's yeah. what I really want. I was deeply satisfied with the aesthetic in, in No Man's Sky. I'm deeply satisfied with it, but not enough to continue playing for 100 hours. And that's the problem. Okay. Well, I think that was a good, uh, mostly a No Man's Sky discussion, but a good topic that sort of broached exploration and, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and issues with procedural generation that we might still encounter for some time until we refine it. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 75 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, the third in our series of discussions on repetitive elements in games. I'm Chris. I'm Doc. I'm Jim. And I'm Will. And we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible. <laughs>